sharing some of my political views and my reflections of the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Michael Manley. I have never been a member of or a supporter of any political party, mainly because I see partisan politics as one of the most destructive forces to be unleashed upon humanity. As a citizen of a country, I am obligated to respect and obey the laws of that country. It is my civic duty to vote according to my conscience and not along party lines. I try very hard not to get them brangled into partisan political dialogues and criticisms of one party over another. Because when you feed energy into the reverberating negative influence of partisan politics, all you do is divide people and put them into a state of antagonism against each other. Yes, there must be opposition, but the opposition should be constructive and only in the interest of the country and the people. When criticisms are leveled by one party against another solely for political expediencies and political opportunities, the end result is merely chaos division, and even violence. Now of Michael Manley. During the years of Michael Manley's early political career, or my awareness of his early political career, as a young radical, I was never one of his followers, nor was I a follower of any political protagonist. I did admire, and to a certain extent, morally supported Manley's vision for an egalitarian system and a more equitable distribution of the natural resources of our country. I admired his zest for free education for all and the need to eliminate systems which supported and enhanced only the privileged and the affluent. Though we may have had similar or parallel social visions, I did not share his confidence and optimism that the Jamaican people were ready to embrace his vision of democratic socialism. I was very ambivalent about how effective what Manley wanted to do would play out in the long run. Still, I liked his commitment and the afflatus he displayed trying to bring about the somewhat unpopular social revolution which he believed was in the interest of the academic and economic advancement of Jamaica. Jamaica, a country freshly emerging from the clutches of colonialism, which had controlled its economic resources and to a very large extent the minds of its people, was without question in a state of flux. And even in what Manley described, and I quote, a state of dependent psychology, unquote. Though we were one of the most radical countries in the Caribbean to aggressively establish its freedom from colonialism, the minds of the proletariat were still inebriated by the many years of brainwashing under colonial rule. They could not vividly discern that we were now adumbrated by the shadow of neocolonialism masquerading under the guise of independence. Manley's thinking was too advanced for even many of his followers to understand, and too revolutionary for the ruling class to be comfortable with. The panic alarms began to sound when he tried to maximize the revenue which Jamaica received from the bauxite companies. The imperialist mines screamed foul and made false alarms of impending nationalism and a communist takeover. At that period in Jamaican, Jamaica's history, the term democratic socialism translated into one meaning and one meaning only, communism. That understanding had nothing to do with reality or facts. It was solely a result of a pervasive mental conditioning backed by aggressive propaganda. 
I honestly do not believe even today that Manley was a communist. I believe that his intentions were good, but his visions at the time somewhat lacked pragmatism and his concept of its practical application and acceptance was seemingly nebulous. When Manley started diplomatic relations with Cuba, this angered the United States, a country with an inordinate fear of communism. His refusal to cut ties with Castro was interpreted as defiance to Henry Kissinger, the then American Secretary of State. This was a time when he needed to be sagacious enough to be able to negotiate between a noble ideal and the welfare of his people. The Jamaican economy went into a tailspin. There was a shortage of foreign exchange. The price of oil rose by almost 400%. There was shortage of basic food items like rice, sugar, flour, milk, detergent, and salt fish. These conditions created social unrest and violence. The fact that other insidious forces were at work against, were at work against him meant nothing to the people. They were concerned about their own welfare and the social challenges facing them. Many began to see democratic socialism exactly as the opponents of Manley wanted them to see. Bad for Jamaica and will ruin the country. Manley himself liked to talk about the dangers of the promises of politics. When they are not fulfilled, to use his own words, the people will chew you up and spit you out, as they did in 1980. Manley's three gravest mistakes were 1. His overestimation of the capacity of his support base. 2. His underestimation of the power of the ruling class. And 3. The determination of the world's most powerful hegemony to subdue smaller nations it considered to be a threat. When he decided to engage in an ideological war with the United States, an ideological war which was not supported internationally, regionally or, regionally or locally, it was a war that Jamaica was sure to lose, especially because of its weak economy, which could so easily be manipulated and bring the country to his knees. Another problem he had was that the opposition was able to corrupt his own social vision and fed it back to the masses in a negative way much more effectively than he could articulate his own vision with convincing clarity, taking it out of the arena of obscurity and ambiguity. I did not doubt Manley's sincerity that he wanted the best for Jamaica, that he wanted to see an enlightened nation where economic affluence did not trammel the will off or block the path to opportunity from the less economically fortunate. When he lost the elections in 1980, I believe it was best for the Jamaican economy. Had Manley won the elections, an aggressive political sabotage would have been unleashed upon his government and Jamaica would have totally collapsed. The foreign exchange situation was so bad that people going overseas on holidays could only legally take 50 US dollars out of the country. People were in dire need for food and basic necessities of life. Many were fleeing from the island as if it was under attack by a foreign power. I left Jamaica in 1982. My leaving had nothing to do with the social conditions. I left when the country was under the government of Edward Siaga, a time when everyone said the threat of communism was over and Jamaica was once again free. After leaving Jamaica, I did not continue to follow the politics of the island and when I returned to visit 12 years later, I had lost all interest in politics. This it is not my intention to praise or castigate Michael Manley. It is merely my thoughts of how I perceive the man. 
My interest in Michael Manley was purely intellectual. I was fascinated by the agility of his mind, the clarity of his flawless and always lucid oratory. Like all men, he had strengths and many weaknesses. But like him or not, there is no doubt that Michael Manley was one of the most influential and charismatic politicians that the Caribbean had ever seen. He will be remembered for very different reasons for a very long time.